The views and opinions expressed by a little bit culty are those of the hosts and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. No, they don't. Any of the ridiculously thought-provoking content provided by our guests, bloggers, sponsors, or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, business, individual, anyone, or anything. Also, we're not doctors, psychologists, or Her Supreme Holiness, Gwyneth Paltrow. Goop. We're just two mortals trying to make a gluten-free, holistically helpful podcast that helps informs and entertains and maybe moisturizes. Silky, silky smooth. Mm. Hey, everybody. Sarah Edmondson here. And I'm Anthony Ames, a.k.a. Nippy, Sarah's husband. And you're listening to A, a Little, Little Bit, Bit Culty, a.k.a. ALBC. A podcast about what happens when devotion goes to the dark side. We've been there and back again. A little about us. True story. We met and fell in love in a cult. And then we woke up and got the hell out of Dodge. And the whole thing was captured in the HBO docuseries, The Vow, now in its second season. I also wrote about our experience in my memoir, Scarred, the true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life. Look at us, a couple of married podcasters who just happen to have a weekly date night where we interview experts and advocates in things like cult awareness and mind control. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. This does not count toward date night, babe. We got to schedule that. That's separate. So those two days we got to hang out? <laughs> we do this podcast thing because we learned a lot on our exit ramp out of Nexium, still on that journey, and we want to pay the lessons forward with the help of other cult survivors and whistleblowers. We know all too well that culty things happen. It happens to people every day across every walk of life. So join us each week to tackle these culty dynamics, everywhere from online dating to mega churches and multi-level marketing. This stuff really is everywhere. The cultiverse just keeps on expanding, and so are we. Welcome to season five of A Little Bit Culty, serving cult content and word salads weekly on your favorite podcast platforms. Learn more at a little bit culty.com. Hello, everyone. How many is everyone, do you think, Sarah? It's 125,000 a week, apparently. At least? At least. All right. We love you all. It's another remix episode of A Little Bit Culty because... It's always good to take some time to look back and reflect. I personally just listened to our episode one and two. And you were blown away, I bet. I <laughs> was blown, You know, honestly, I haven't listened to those episodes since we recorded them. Some of them were almost three years ago. And I thought, wow. <laughs> We did a good job. It's a retrospective, right? It's like going back and reading your old, your old journals. No, it's definitely not like Well, it depends if you're a good writer or not. <laughs> I certainly was. I go back and read my old journals and I throw them away. I keep all my journals. Anyway, we are currently working our tails off on a batch of all new, farm fresh, organic, non-GMO. Pesticide free. Fair trade. Gluten free. Dairy free, sugar free. Dude, that's culty. Yeah, we're we're gonna do an episode oh my on that. God. Episodes for a brand new season. Till then, you can always join us over on Patreon, as you know. That's patreon.com slash a little bit culty for all new weekly episodes, ad free, and other treats. Lots of treats over there. So many treats. Yeah. Sometimes we mail them to you. Sometimes yes. we even show up to your doorstep. Right, Ashley? Yeah. Yep. Yes, we do. But right now we're about to get into the weeds of one of our favorite topics with some of our fan favorites. On today's episode, we are diving headfirst into the fucked up world of abstinence pledges, purity rings, and knee-length skirts. I like how you do your voiceover work and then you cuss. It's like a <laughs> great juxtaposition. On today's episode, we're diving headfirst into the fucked up world. Thank you. I like that. Okay. That's right, Sarah. We're going into purity culture discussion and we aren't pulling out. <laughs> like that? Joining us are three powerhouse guests. First is the most rockin' reverend we've ever met. This is mine because Nadia the Boltz Weber, we used to call her, is an ordained Lutheran pastor, a founder of House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver. She's a progressive, queer-inclusive Lutheran congregation. She's written three New York Times best-selling memoirs, including Shameless, A Sexual Reformation, which takes on what she sees as the harmful ideas about sexuality that Christianity has promoted throughout history. No doubt about that. She is the creator and host of the confessional podcast, a pop-up prayer network called The Chapel, and a wildly inspirational sub-stack called The Corners. She's one of my favorite episodes. I loved her. Still do. Agreed. 
Next up, another favorite, is Alice Gretchen, an actress, author, and founder of Dare to Doubt. Her story includes a painful yet rewarding transition from Christianity to atheism, a journey that inspired her to found daretodoubt.org, a resource site for people detaching from belief systems they come to find harmful. And last but not least is Eric Schwarzenski. And he's the host and creator of the Preacher Boys podcast, which is a platform for survivor stories about deeply disturbing pattern of sexual predation and abuse claims within the independent fundamental Baptist movement, IFB. You don't want to miss a single second of today's show. So let's get started with our personal fuck you to purity culture featuring Natty Boltz Weber, the Boltz Weber, Alice Gretchen, and Eric Schwarzenski. I think when it broke down for me was when, whenever there was a difference between what I experienced to be true and what I was told was true. Like when these things started to be in conflict, that's when I was kind of like, I'm going to have to go with my experience. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for instance, like the gender thing came down to even we'd have Sunday school teachers who were women up until we were 12 years old. And then all of our Sunday school teachers had to be men because 12 year old boys had more like authority in the church than grown women did. And so women were not allowed to teach boys once they were over 12 years old. And when I quickly started asking questions, like if I'm so inferior to this man, who's my Sunday school teacher, why the fuck am I clearly smarter than him? (laughs) And I mean, I mean, just something basic like that. Right. Like I knew that my intellect surpassed this man, very sweet man, who was teaching Sunday school. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Or like when I was told like homosexuality is a sin and you can't really, you shouldn't associate with people who are gay and gay people are going to hell. And, and then like I was a kid who experienced a lot of alienation because of a disease that I had, which was kind of disfiguring from ages 12 to 16. And it made me kind of edgy and a little snarky. And I mean, it made me who I am and I'm grateful for that. But once I got to high school, the only people who seemed to like me and think I was funny and fabulous and wanted me around were the gay boys, the gay theater boys in high school. And they loved me. And it was kind of a first, honestly. It was the first time there was a group of people who kind of felt like they wanted me around. And so basically I'm like, okay, here I have this conflict between what I'm experiencing, which is this love from these gay guys in high school and what I'm told is true. And when those things started to be in conflict, I had to default to what I was experiencing as having some kind of authority. Mm -hmm. So basically in conservative Christianity, there's this incredible authority structure and there's a continual indoctrinization, especially of the children, children and teenagers, where basically you're told, here's what it looks like to be a person who's worthy of God's love. You have to repent of all your sins. You have to only think healthy, you know, clean thoughts. You have to only be around other Christians. You have to have your quiet time in the in the morning with the Lord. You have to, you know, not feel up your girlfriend. And I mean, it's just, it's a continual indoctrinization of what it looks like to be good. And of course, as a kid, you don't know any better. You mm-hmm. want to be good. Like you want to, you want the, the adults in your life to be proud of you. The rebellion thing doesn't come till later. And so, you're forced into this system. And we were taught to be very afraid of the world. Like the world is corrupt. You should not be part of the world. But once I got out into the world, I'm like, what the fuck is these people's problem? (laughs) It's great out here, you know? So again, there was that conflict, even with the, you know, my last book was about sex and Christianity. And even when it came to sex, there was so much fear around it. If you wear shirts that are too tight, boys will be made to lust and it'll be your fault. And if you allow yourself to go on a date alone, you might be tempted to sin. And if you give in to your lustful sexual desires outside of the bond of heterosexual marriage, you will destroy your life. You will become tainted. Nobody will want you. You will have given yourself to somebody and you won't have as much to give your spouse. You know, I mean, it's just constant. Constant indoctrinization around sex. And yet, 
when I had sex for the first time with my boyfriend, I was like, this is awesome. Like <laughs> I had great sex as a teenager, which I, I know isn't like super common, but I was like, this is definitely for me. And I think these people are insane. Hmm. So for some reason, I was able to go, yeah, bye. Amazing. I'm so glad that you did. What is it about the Lutheran doctrine or church that's not problematic for you? It's just a completely different theological system. Okay. The whole point of gravity to Lutheran theology is grace. Mm. It's not making yourself good. It's not piety. It's not earning your worthiness or, you know, pretending to have a personality you don't or <laughs> whatever. It's like our origin in God is grace itself. The fact that we're alive is grace. The fact that our worst mistakes never define who we actually are is grace. There's enough mercy and compassion in our divine source for us to draw upon and that we shouldn't fall into traps of believing otherwise. And like just the sort of super honest thing of Look, we're all simultaneously sinner and saint. We all live in this paradox of being like good and bad. And if we think we're all one and not the other, we're telling ourselves a lie, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah. And if you don't make allowance for the bad, you can't evolve it to be the quote good that you're aspiring to be. It doesn't work where you just ignore it. Do you find totally. that the Lutheran part at least makes allowances for that in terms oh, of Oh, totally. I mean, it? like, I'm never, people are like, <gasps> I can't believe that this person did this horrible thing. I'm always like, oh, dude, I totally can believe it. Right. <laughs> like humans are horrible. Are you kidding? <laughs> so like, I'm never shocked. And people who are super optimistic about human beings, like who are really idealists, I don't know. I'm like, do you read the paper? Like, like, right. like look, at, look at how terrible we are. Also, you in, know? in the face of certain religions, a lot of bad things have been done in the name of religion. So just pick up a history book from probably your own religion at some point, you guys didn't embody what you profess. So, But just to be fair, Christians aren't the only one pulling this, trying to pull this off. Sure, I mean, there's a lot of new age shit out there that is very similar, Mm -hmm. you know, in the sense of going like the thing about evangelical Christianity, there's this toxic positivity Mm -hmm. to it, Mm -hmm. super duper cheerfulness and only positive things and giving glory to the Lord. And (laughs) I just, I just want to praise the, I mean, half the things they say, I'm like, what does that actually even mean? (laughs) But you're supposed to adopt a certain affect. If you are to be seen as like holy and righteous, mm-hmm. right. and it's the same in like like super new agey yoga. I mean, yes. so, at some point somebody decide having like super duper like painfully good posture and like speaking with like a, a passive aggressive half whisper, like you maybe took half a dose of Xanax. <laughs> like that's supposed that's like someone decided. Sarah, do you want to chime in on how I'm <laughs> allergic to all that? Nobody hates that. But by the way, toxic positivity has been a theme this season. So you're bringing it back for us really nicely. But Nippy has an impression of that character, that yoga (laughs) character. Oh my God. So so I have a web series that I wrote an episode for and Uh we shot it. We shot it like a month before our lives blew up and I had to put a lot of it on pause. And because some of the people were involved, were still involved with the cult and blah, blah, blah. And it's essentially an episode about really what you just did. It's like, I started doing yoga consistently when I, when I got out here and I don't do it that much anymore because of COVID and and all that. And there's this woman in there and everyone's taking it seriously. And and you don't know me well, but I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like a jock, you know, I mean, I mean, I was a jock growing up and you're not kind of a jock, baby. You are the epitome of jock. Yoga is stretching for me. Okay, let's just right. let's call it what it sure. is. And I go in there and all joking aside, I, you know, I, I, I experience, I like it. I have good experience in it. And, but this woman just goes, now I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to take that negative thought right out of your head. And I'm going, I'm not having a fucking negative thought right now. Not till now. Like, yeah, not till now. Till now. No, but this, is, this was the joke in my web series. I was like, and that thought that you're not good enough. And I was like, listen, sweetheart, my problem is not, I don't think I'm good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm arrogant and have a big ego. What do I do with that? Like, right. you know, it's like, this isn't my room. Women are often like, how did you find your voice? I'm like, knowing when to shut the fuck up has been much more my issue in my life than finding my voice. Yeah. yeah. But see, we all have the thing that has, you know, that has a bit of a shadow to it or, or that is a struggle for us or attaches to our ego or like, we all have that, right? It's just going right. to look different. Anyway, getting back to the the Christian thing Mm -hmm. and the cult thing, both is that the thing that 
feels so, that just sort of like hurts me when I think about what happens in these groups is that honestly, it feels like the thing that is exploited in people who become part of these are actually good parts of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not their like arrogance that's exploited necessarily, or like, you know, that they want to control people or that, you know, they want to manipulate. It, usually it's like, you want to be part of a community. Yep. You want a sense of belonging. You want to be somebody who strives to improve themselves or to live in a good way or to be somehow countercultural. I think, you know, Maybe if our culture wasn't so fucked up, people wouldn't be so drawn to more extreme, like, countercultures. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, the impulse to, like, be a part of something that's potentially beautiful is a good impulse. And that's what's exploited. We tell our stories. We change the world. A Little Bit Culty is proud to support the hashtag I Got Out project, which empowers survivors of cultic abuse to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn more about the hashtag I Got Out movement and find resources at igotout.org. Meals bring people together, but for many families, providing their next meal can be a challenge. You can help by participating in Macy's annual Feeding the Hungry food drive. All proceeds go toward local food banks and families. Now through January 31st, you can purchase an icon in-store or online, or watch out for the blue Feeding the Hungry shelf tags, where a portion of your purchase will be donated to local pantries. Together, we can combat hunger in our local communities at Macy's. The Frankies were a picture-perfect influencer family, but everything wasn't as it seemed. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here asking for help. He's emaciated. He's got tape around his legs. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. Infamous is covering Ruby Frankie, the world of Mormonism, and a secret therapy group that ruined lives. Listen to Infamous wherever you get your podcasts. I was 17 years old. A big part of the type of Christianity that I was brought up in was centered around what's now called purity culture. And for anyone who's not familiar, it's a very overbearing emphasis on sexual purity for both boys and girls. But girls have the added burden of being the gatekeepers of boys, not just for their actions, but for even their thoughts. And so girls have to be essentially thought police, not only for ourselves and each other, but for the men around us to make sure that we're not going to behave or speak or dress or laugh even in a way that might make a male around us stumble into sin by causing him to lust or essentially be attracted to us. So Mm -hmm. basically, we were told the lip service of men, you need to be responsible for your own thoughts and actions. That's between you and God. But girls... You, it is your responsibility to help support your brothers in Christ by making sure you are modest at all times with every deed, word, and action. Another part of this purity culture that I took to probably one of the more oomph degrees, there were varying degrees of commitment to purity culture in the youth groups that I found myself. Like some teenagers would date, you know, I I don't think that they would have admitted if they were having sex before marriage because that was just a given. You just don't. Also not being anything other than heterosexual was just a given. So we didn't even talk about non-binariness or or homosexuality uh, in my youth group specifically, not to my recollection. For me, in my heart, because I always took things very seriously and very literally, I believed that God wanted me to be faithful to my future husband before I even knew him. And this came from a a Bible verse in the book of Proverbs about how the woman did her husband good and not evil all the days of her life. So to do one's husband good then meant that you are faithful to him in every way before you even know who he is, which meant for me not dating, not flirting, not even letting myself have a crush, which I really struggled with. And I write about that in my book because I was 
I was a really boy crazy teen girl. It was like the thorn in my side. I thought that, you know, like, fuck, like, I guess this is the big sin that, because it was other, not committing other sins came pretty easily to me. I wasn't really tempted to lie or cheat or like do drugs. You know, it was, I was tempted to have a crush. And so I denied myself all these things, fully buying into the promise that if I was faithful to this future spouse, who I would eventually find out because God would confirm it through my spiritual elders and through the man himself. Because there's always a question like, well, how are you going to know who your future husband is if you don't date? Well, God's going to tell you. God's going to tell the uh, other people in your life and, and affirm, confirm it externally so that you don't have to doubt yourself and doubt if it's your own fleshly desires to marry a certain person. So I how bought convenient. into it. <laughs> how convenient. <laughs> You're suppressing natural instincts and those instincts that you follow are the ones where you make mistakes and you grow and you, you're not only just denying yourself things, you're denying yourself the wisdom that comes from dating and figuring out that's not the and person, et cetera. Uh, right. Yes. And what your, what your needs and wants are and how to right. learn how to communicate, how to compromise, what turns you on, what turns you off, you know? And like, there's, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of that that gets stunted mm -hmm. when you grow up in this sort of sort of thing. And, you know, like I said, I took it really to heart. I really bought into it. And so when I was 17, right before I turned 17, I moved to Los Angeles because around that time, you know, God had called me to acting and I moved to Los Angeles. And the first couple months, my mom and my siblings were here with me. And then once I got a roommate, they went back home to Colorado. Coincidentally in Christianity, there's no such thing as coincidence, but coincidentally, a boy from my Colorado youth group also moved to LA around the same time. He was three years older than me, so he was 20. And I just thought like God had to move there to be a friend, to help me navigate this hedonistic secular world I'd never been a part of because I was homeschooled my entire life until I went to community college briefly. So there was that added layer of insulation from the outside world. I very rarely have ever interacted with people who did not share my belief system. So I thought like, oh, God called Luke to move out here the same time as me because he knew I'd need a friend to like, help me navigate because Luke had gone to public school. So that was my logic at the time. He was just a friend and he knew that I didn't date. He'd expressed when we were on a mission trip in India that he'd like to get to know me better. And I had been very upfront with him that, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my future husband and I don't think that would honor him. And God's called me to this and that, and I don't date. And he was like, cool, we can be friends. So we were friends. And when he moved out here, yeah, we just I, again, reiterated to him, like, we're just friends. Our hangouts are not dates. Could not have been clearer. One day, out of the blue, he announced that God had shown him I was his future wife. And it always sounds like crazy to say out loud and, and from the place I am now because I went along with it instantly instantly. Like there was never a part of me that was like, come on, dude, like you're just projecting your own motives. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like what you said earlier, Sarah. Um, yes. No, for me, it was like, how could I have not seen this coming? Of course it would be him. God had us move out here at the same time, blah, 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 blah. you know, and that was the biggest red flag because I did not feel anything romantically for him. And I've been told that God was going to bless me with this epic love story and reward my faith with this, you know, incredible romance. And I was just, again, I was a boy, crazy, romantic teenage girl. And I just believed that it was going to be, you know, even better than anything I could imagine if I trusted God to let it happen. And so that it, it was revealed to be Luke just broke me. It devastated me. And of course, I couldn't even process that because I was so scared that if I admitted even to my own self that I was disappointed, it meant I was going against God and therefore allowing Satan a foothold. Because it wasn't just Luke saying this. Long story short, he called my dad to formally ask for my hand in marriage. My dad also expressed that God had shown him that Luke and I were going to get married. Luke's mom, who to my recollection was considered something of like a prophet psychic -y type in our community had also heard from God that I was to be your future daughter-in-law. So there was all of this external confirmation that confirmed it was not just Luke's own fleshly desires. And because God, again, had never talked to me directly, I just figured, of course, you know, why would God have told me 
And furthermore, it makes sense that God would have told Luke and not me because this is the beginning of me learning how to submit to my husband's leadership. You know, female submission to the male headship of, in the household is a heavily in- stressed aspect of this, this expression of Christianity. So, you know, we were, we were betrothed. That's the word that I came to use because I couldn't say engaged because when I thought of people who were engaged, they always seemed so happy. And I felt mm-hmm. like I was facing an arranged marriage. It wasn't arranged in the sense that like, you know, our parents got together and decided this was going to happen. It felt like God arranged this marriage and his divine plan for our lives. And I was supposed to either go along with it, but God did give me free will so I could choose not to go along with it. But God also allows consequences to those who disobey his will. So it's like, you know, you have free will, but it's your choice to go to hell. You can do that. God loves you enough to give you that choice. That's very confusing. That is (laughs) so confusing. And also, you know, Alice, when you said this sounds crazy, I think if I hadn't gone through my own experience or done, you know, all this research on all these different groups, I probably wouldn't get it. But I do get it because your framework, you explained your framework, your beliefs and your assumptions that everything rests on, which is that like God exists and he knows best, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and he decides. So in that framework, what you're saying wasn't crazy and also totally relatable. We didn't have God, but Keith is good Mm -hmm. and he knows best. So it's the Mm -hmm. same fucking thing, right? It is. It, I totally, totally get it. I was so happy when your mom stepped in and gave you permission <laughs> to not marry him. I was like, yay, mom. Because up until now, I'd been kind of pissed at your parents <laughs> in the story. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and now I was like, oh, mom. And then I cried because yes. like my mom also like helped me out of my journey, as you know. And, and I had this big like mom cry. I'm so happy yeah. that she she gave you that out, which was to say like also another interpretation of God is that God wants you to be happy and God is love and not pain, actually. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because like, spoiler alert, like I'm really close with my parents now. Yes. I'm and so happy to hear that. <laughs> yes, I, I am. And, uh, you know, they left that type of Christianity too. They don't even really call themselves Christians anymore, but it took years for them and their own story is, is theirs, you know, and their, their timelines a, a little different than mine and their and from each other's too. Hey there, listener. Hope you're enjoying this episode and that you're taking deep breaths when we cover the enraging stuff that cult jerks are up to. Let it out is in the yoga practice. Inhale positivity, exhale negativity. That's for you, Sarah. We got this. No hulking it out, all you little hulksters. And if you need some helpful resources on the topic of cult recovery, check out our website at a littlebitculty.com. And now here's a brief message from our sponsors. Meals bring people together, but for many families, providing their next meal can be a challenge. You can help by participating in Macy's annual Feeding the Hungry Food Drive. All proceeds go toward local food banks and families. Now through January 31st, you can purchase an icon in-store or online, or watch out for the blue Feeding the Hungry shelf tags, where a portion of your purchase will be donated to local pantries. Together, we can combat hunger in our local communities at Macy's. And the thing I realized is that, and it's one reason I I do listen to your show. You know, I I really do like the approach to it. And one thing that I, you know, I told Nippy before we hit record is like, I like that uh, tongue in cheek, you know, I love that you guys are so refrained with what you think about things, Mm -hmm. you know, like you, you share very heavily when you're pissed, you can tell. And, but the thing is I've realized in the last two years, like no matter how much you couch what you're saying, no matter how many caveats you add, no matter how much you right. say not all churches, mm-hmm. no matter how much you say probably not you, people are going to be pissed if it touches their territory. Totally. At all. And so, totally. you know, if I'm going to call out rape in a church, like I'd rather just be blunt about it than saying, now look, before I talk about this, I know it's not all churches. I know it's not. <laughs> if someone's upset, I'm talking about their church. Right. If you're not upset and you agree that rape is bad, I'm not. Right. <laughs> I'm not Honestly, talking about it. Honestly, I think you hit the nail Nailed on the it. head. Finally, 45 minutes in, I've hit a nail. Good. <laughs> you, you well, a few. <laughs> I mean, when people like I've aired my support, even just kind of offhand for, for certain people. And every time I put my flag in the ground, it's very small. It's like one or two. Someone's going to send me an email with a link and how my thinking is wrong. Listen, I have a different opinion. I have yeah. a different stance. And that's on okay. Things. I'm certainly <laughs> willing to kick it around. That's what this is about, right? And yours is extreme. Yeah. So like, I like the fact that like I'm standing against rape against this church instead of you lambasting me for it, right? 
get curious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your curiosity can free you no. from the thing that I, I'm talking about. And, and, and to your point, I'm probably saying something that conflicts with what your stance is, which is okay. I had a pastor, I mean, when I announced that I left the faith entirely, he tweeted and he said, it's sad when someone focuses on the bad so much that's all that they can see. And then he said something about like, I focused on Jesus, mm -hmm. so I, I've seen the good, right. you know, like I haven't lost sight of the good. And my response to him was like, I've been focused on the bad mm -hmm. for the last two years. The bad seemed awfully focused on my denomination for the last 18 and the last several decades before that and the last mm -hmm. century that it's been around. It seems like without focusing on it, we had a predator shuffle to my church without focusing on it. The person I worked for in ministry was paying me 11 grand a year while paying himself a high six figure salary. It seems like without focusing on it, I got fired mm -hmm. from my, that same job because I didn't want to pray and lay my hand on a flag and hope that Donald Trump would be president. Like it seems to me that the bad was kind of drawn to the denomination. And instead of asking why I'm seeing the bad and focusing on the bad, right. why is there right. bad if we're claiming to be this righteous group that's set on a hill and supposed to be the example for all mankind? Like, mm -hmm. why is the bad here? That's such a good message. And I Great. think that's something that all the denominations, all the religions, all the groups have to be able to do. If you're if you're saying like the be better, not bitter, and don't focus on the bad or whatever, yeah. in the next thing we used to call it a shifter strategy. Keith taught us this. It's like, look over here. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we're talking about this. Let's focus on this. It's important to look at this. Mm -hmm. We must for the safety of our children. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, it, it, again, it, like it just hurts my heart that this is happening. And I guess my question for you now is like, what do you say to people who might be listening to this? Because probably people in IFB are not listening to this, but they might. And I hope they do. Oh, they we, we, if we use the right <laughs> hashtags, they're you know, listening, if they're listening to sure. this, what would you say to them to help you change that pattern of avoiding this conversation. I mean, it, it's kind of that thing that was said earlier, like it's be curious about it. What is being said? It's hard whenever this question comes up because I think about like, what would I have listened to in it? If it was someone else and I would have been like, why would I listen to them? Like they said a bad word on a podcast. Yeah. So like, obviously Sorry. they're not Christians <laughs> and they're not, you know, whatever. There's, yeah, there's a lot of things that are going to be, be said there, but I would just say like, how many people does it have to happen to for it to become an issue? And how many times does it have to be covered up before it's a systemic issue? I'll say this specifically, if you're a pastor listening to this, cause I know that there's IP pastors that listen to all the stuff that I do. Cause I get tweets about it and sermon things about it. My question to them would just be like, when do you address that this is like a really <laughs> toxic environment that's producing this? I don't judge any pastor. When you have a church of 50 people, if you're there for a couple decades or a couple years, you're going to have something bad happen in your church, in your congregation. The pedophiles are everywhere. You're going to have, if you get a hundred people in a room, there's someone really shitty there. At some point, there's someone bad there. I don't judge someone for that, but how do you react when you find out? Is it cover it up because we want to protect the church? Is it cover it up because we believe that he has more value to us than this girl does? That's the thing is like, I'm not going after every church and saying like, oh, if you have anything bad happen ever, you're <laughs> evil and wicked and you should be destroyed. But when it's happening consistently, when you have churches like Faith Baptist Church in Wildemar that has four or five of these cases over a decade with four or five different people, mm -hmm. start asking questions. Like, why is this happening? Why do we seem to be like a lightning rod for abuse? Again, I'm not asking people to like leave their faith or do something like that. Why this? One of the things I saw in, in one of your other interviews is your new your new mantra about the microphone. So what, what needs to happen now to expose this stuff? Yeah, it's conversations. Like this is something that people get wrong is that they look at people like listening to this episode. There's people that go, man, Sarah and Nippy are just great advocates. I'm glad that someone is being an advocate. And, you know, cause you have a podcast and a platform and they'll look at me and go, wow, that's great. I wish I would love mm -hmm. to be one, but I don't have a podcast or I don't have a rally that I host or I don't have this or a picket or whatever it is. You just need to find mm -hmm. a person who has a story uh, Sarah, you said this in one of the mm -hmm. recent episodes, like hold space for them. There's so many opportunities we have on a small scale, a big scale to advocate for other people. And so when you notice something's wrong, the easy option is what I initially did, which is that was awful for me, a totally self-centered approach. That was awful that someone was abused and I had to deal with my youth pastor being mean to me because I said something about it. I got the mm -hmm. easy version of the story. I left for the rest of those couple years not thinking about what mm -hmm. about all these other people that were hurt? What about the people that are still being hurt? What about the people that I left flyers on their door who are now going to the same church as a pedophile that I invite? Like 
I have a responsibility to talk about this. And, and I still like every day I think about if someone gets hurt, cause he's still at the church. What? His, his wife is literally, his wife's the principal of the school now that I went to. It's like, he has so much access. And for me, it's like, if something happens and I don't say anything, like I'm a part of this, Ugh, yeah. whether I'm a part of the denomination or not, I am. Find a way to help people share their stories. It doesn't have to be a podcast. Like it takes a certain type of person that can get in front <laughs> yeah. of a microphone and be willing to do this. Mm-hmm. You either love it or you absolutely hate it, you know, but it could mean when when someone at work tells you that someone harassed them, go with them to HR, find a way for them to tell their story, repost someone's episode when they share something that's difficult, text somebody and ask, how can I help you? Like find a way to pass the mic to somebody. I mean, I grew up listening to pastors, the, the whole pass the mic thing. I grew up listening to pastors who now I know are connected with abusers who were abusers themselves. And then every single Sunday, two times a day, sometimes three, if they did Sunday school too. And then Wednesday night, they got a microphone, got to go conference got a microphone, got to share their version of the story, got to share why the church was the way it was and how great things were, what God was doing. But the people that never got the microphone were the women and children being abused in the Mm -hmm. church. So how can we, when we leave an organization like this, take the microphone from those people, take the attention from those people, from the Keith Ranieri's, from the Jack Hiles, from the, you know, whoever you want to fill in the blank there, and now give that to people who were harmed by them and let them share their story in the way that they want to share it. That's a powerful thing to be able to do for mm-hmm. someone. And it's it's something that, again, people assume because I don't have a million followers, I can't be an advocate. Do it with your family. Do it with yeah. your friend. Like, do it with your three or four people that you can do it with because it can make a big difference. What a great message. Yeah, such a good message. And I saw on your merch store that you have a shirt that says purity culture is great. Could you just tell us, just, just give us a little nugget about what you mean by that for those who don't know what purity culture is and how it relates to rape? It proves that I don't like beating around the bush, I guess. Yes, it's very direct. <laughs> it's no, good. I mean, this kind of goes back to the culture. I mean, my show Preacher Boys is because they called like young people pastors and young kids that were going to college to become pastors. They called them preacher boys. And so I, I named my show that to, Mm -hmm. it kind of gets the attention of anybody who grew up in it. And then everyone else goes Mm -hmm. like, Oh, you're a preacher. (laughs) Like they get confused what the name is. It really is that there's a very much a boys club mentality within the independent Baptist world. Purity culture is an issue. I'm sure if you've talked to people in the evangelical world, they brought it up and on some level, but essentially the idea that women are responsible for the actions of men is something that's very deeply entrenched within the IFB movement. You know, that's the reason that women wear skirts and not pants because pants outline your leg. Women can't wear shirts that go more than two fingers below their, their neck because that would show cleavage. You know, they have to close pin this slit in the back of a skirt. So you can't see the back of their leg. Like there's all these rules and restrictions and regulations on women. And so you've got these two things. You've got the woman who's being taught their whole life. Like you're a temptress, Mm -hmm. you are full of shame. You are responsible for if any guy looks at you and, and lusts after you and commits adultery in his heart, you caused it. And then you have men who are being taught to act like children their entire lives and saying, don't jerk off, don't have sex. But once you get married, anytime you want it, you've got it. And then you've got a spouse who's not allowed to say no. So you've got this very horrible environment in which we're hypersexualizing young kids and talking about whether or not, you know, little kids can wear sleepers because it shows too much or they can't wear this because it shows too much <sighs> when they're like six months old. Then they grow up to be 20 years old, getting married out of high school to some preacher boy. And they have a toxic, unhealthy relationship where they don't understand consent. They don't understand their own sexuality. They don't understand what a healthy relationship looks like. And so for me, like that's one of the areas I've dipped in to addressing like, okay, we're having all of this. We have a rape culture situation within this denomination. What are we teaching from an early age that kind of leads to that? I'm not saying that people are not responsible for their actions. Cause I think some people will say, oh, I was mm-hmm. raised in it, whatever. We can still look at what some of the causes are without alleviating Absolutely. people of their own responsibility. If you're raping somebody, you're responsible for, for sure. that. I don't care what you were taught. I was taught all that stuff and I don't rape people. Right. So you, you have a responsibility there, but that's <sighs> in a nutshell what it is. Thank you. Thank you. You probably could do a whole episode on that. You know, <laughs> you are part of this team, I For think, sure. you know, in terms of shining light on, on abuses and no. felt that from the moment we spoke on your pod last year. And I just, I really commend you. I know it's dark work and it's hard and, it, and Nippy and I have certainly been mm-hmm. depressed after covering certain content. No, it's, it's really The difficult. way you go about it's um, great. 
This podcast is brought to you by Citizens of Sound, a podcast production agency committed to developing and launching shows with gravity and depth. From conception to launch, Citizens will partner with you every step of the way, whether you're an actor, business owner, doctor, fitness coach, hairstylist, or influencer. Connection is the future of communication. Jump on board with Citizens of Sound today and start your show. Go to citizensofsound.com and follow them on Instagram. And trust me, it'll be a really good decision for you. How was that for you all? Did that fuck you purity culture episode make you clutch your pearls? I doubt it. Our listeners aren't big pearl clutchers. Way too much innuendo in that sentence. <laughs> I'll leave it alone. Hope you like the episode and it makes you want to go out there and do impure things. Honestly, we love this journey for you. Life is short. Purity is boring. We'll be back soon with all new episodes. And in the meantime, you can always find us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash littlebitculty, dropping new episodes every week. Also, please go to a little bit culty dot com slash sponsors to see all our fabulous sponsors. Check out the goods we have there. As you probably know, we don't get commission, but purchasing treats for yourself through our sponsorship links gives you a discount and lets our sponsors know that this works for them and they continue to sponsor us. And that continues the podcast to keep going. So thank you for doing that. And also on that link is a couple of- Great housekeeping, by the way. Thank you. Great housekeeping. Our couple of speaking engagements, one in person here in Atlanta and one which is a free online trauma summit. Both of those links you can find on our sponsorship page. Please do let us know what you think of the episode. Send us a review wherever you listen. And until next time, go out and do naughty shit and laugh about it. Just don't join a cult. Capiche? Sink and dive to the depths of the ocean. I'm hanging on to the weight of my love. If I let go of it all, I could leave. But I know I won't. Hope you like this episode. Let's keep the conversation going and come hang out with us on Patreon where we keep the tape rolling each week with special episodes just for Patreon subscribers and where we get deep into the weeds of unpacking every episode of The Vow. And if you're looking for our show notes or some sweet, sweet swag or official ALBC podcast merch or a list of our most recommended cult recovery resources, visit our website at alittlebitculty.com. And for more background on what brought us here, check out Sarah's page-turning memoir. It's called Scarred true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life. It's available on Amazon, Audible, narrated by my wife, and at most bookstores. A Little Bit Culty is a talk house podcast and a Trace 120 production. We're executive produced by Sarah Edmondson and Anthony Nippy Ames with writing, research, and additional production support by senior producer Jess Tardy. We're edited, mixed, and mastered by our rocking producer, Will Rutherford of Citizens of Sound. And our amazing theme song, Cultivated, is by John Bryant and co-written by Nigel Aslan. Thank you for listening.